Good evening, everyone. I'm John. Um, I'm one of the heads of product at OVO. I look after payments, billing and collections and trading, all the fun stuff you're going. And yes, I really would love to talk to you about your energy bill. So you can imagine I am a thriller at parties, amongst other things. Yeah. Um, prior to uh, working at OVO, I used to work for First Direct, HBC and Halifax, so background in financial services, looking after mobile banking apps and things. Um, came and talked to one of these events a couple of years ago. And I noticed what got a real reaction was, and bluntly, you were not interested in my little success stories, my little reel of like, I'm really proud of this. What really got people interested was the epic failures. So with that in mind and that audience feedback, allow me to sort of crudely jam a metaphor into this and then sort of share some of the more epic failures, both in my career and sort of ones from tech and see what some of the lessons that we can learn from those. I'm someone that loves to sort of try and crowbar a metaphor in when I'm trying to explain something to my team. It's one of my many foibles and sort of, I know I catch myself saying, you know, let's not reinvent the wheel. I um, heard an interview with a lady on the radio about a month ago actually talking about how often actually the wheel had been reinvented. Managed to find this from the joys of the interweb from sort of, you know, just from materials so there. You know, the basic shape in terms of it's round, John, yes, thank you, get that. But in terms of the material that's been used and actually you know, what it's being used for has continued to evolve. So basic form, basic structure, basic spec, if you were to break it down, yes, it's round, it goes onto something, brilliant. But how it's been made, what it's been used for, some of those non-functional requirements has continued to evolve throughout the time and people have continued to reinvent the wheel. And if anyone's a bicyclist sort of thing, you'll see from you know carbon fiber spokes, etc. There's there's evolution going on there, or at least trying to flog you more expensive things in real time. Now, does anyone know actually? And this is going to really super quick. Where did the wheel originate? Because actually, the the original wheel was so archaeologists and uh, believe was actually the potter's wheel. So the wheel was actually horizontal rather than vertical. And it's from there that someone obviously at some point had the idea of, right, we need to shift all this stuff, let's use these things then that we've got lying around. So the wheel had been actually you know, reinvented fundamentally from the potter's wheel into something used for transport and transit. So just to labour the analogy a bit more there on this metaphor, then you know, the wheel has been continued to be reinvented. It's changed from its original purpose and also its materials as well. To the success of the wheel, it proliferates. And does anyone know what the, that pub quiz trick around what's the biggest manufacturer of wheels in the world at the moment? Lego. Lego, yeah. So, no mini eggs on this presentation, but yeah, consider yourself up on the status points. Right, there's some further opportunities to uh, wow the audience with questions in this. Now, product market fit. Um, so, a few definitions here around product market fit. So, the wheel, I think we can say, has got product market fit in its sort of evolution as it's evolved. So, Mark Andreessen defined it as about putting a product that satisfies the market need. You find the needs that are not being catered for and you create a product unique to such needs. Um, is it something we glibly trot out or is it referring to a runaway success or failure if you work in product? Possibly. Or is it, I know it when I see it, which is actually applied to hardcore pornography, I believe, by this point. But broadly speaking, the spirit being, I can't quite say what it is, but when I know it, I'll see it, that's got product market fit. Now, because it's product and because we are where we are, there's a framework for this. There's also a process. Now, I suppose my slight cynicism at this point is you can follow all these things, but rather like any recipe and giving a 10-year-old a recipe, it does not guarantee success. There is always an element of surprise, I suppose, luck, skill, call it what you will around it. Are you actually going to get there? There's also how do you actually measure it if you think you've got it? Now, there's been proposed that there's a, uh, a number in terms of actually could you live without this product? And if 40% of people say, no, no, I'd, I'd rather sell my children than give this back sort of thing, then broadly speaking, you've got product market fit. Also, is it NPS in terms of net promoter score? You know, when people sell for you. So the belief around NPS that actually, if people are willing to enthuse about your product, share that positive experience, 
that's when you've got product market fit. So, this is what the textbook or the, you know, some of the frameworks or even the internet tells us. Let's have a look at some of the failures and I'll expose some of my uh, happy successes as well in terms of benefit from my experience where other people have paid for my mistakes. Um, so, why no product market fit? Clayton Christian said that out of 30,000 new products that launch every year, an alarming 95% of them fail. So, if you launch a product that doesn't quite meet what you say, you're in good company. That is the sort of standard experience, so to speak. It's the exceptional, almost ones that succeed. The reason sort of postulated is they don't meet customer needs in a way that is better than any other alternatives. So is that that the problem you solve is not significant enough for customers to pay? So this is a classic kind of like customer research thing instead of the customer say, yeah, yeah, I'll, I like that, I'll buy that, and <laughs> still there, they do not buy it in terms of you like it enough to want to use it, but maybe not to pay for it. Um, your product isn't easy to use. So just generally, how does this work? Um, you're a late entrant in a crowded space with little differentiation, so you've launched another water bottle. Congratulations, why should I buy you? Um, and or your product is not sufficiently more compelling than the existing alternatives and the customer doesn't want to change. And that's quite a high threshold to get over in terms of particularly, bluntly, as I get older, I'm less proposed to sort of try something new just because I'm happy with what I'm doing, it does what I want to do, why would I want to change? and that whiff and what's in it for me around changing gets quite hard actually to shift in terms of it does the same, maybe it's a bit better, is it a lot better, is it enough to make me want to change? And just because you can doesn't mean you should. Right, let's look at some of these in terms of from the uh, school of epic and not so epic failures. So, first Apple mobile phone, yeah, was it 9.40am on January the 9th, 2007, yeah? Hands in the air, who thinks that was the first Apple mobile? Or was it actually this thing, 18 months earlier? Um, the uh, Motorola Rocker. Does anyone remember this? I know, um, um, generation, I'm getting a few nods on this one, no. Right, so this was launched 18 months ahead of the iPhone, effectively, in terms of, and you can begin to see why. And Apple partnered with Motorola to launch the E1, the rocker, um, advert, if you remember it, fronted by Madonna as well. Um, it was the first Cupertino sanctioned cell phone, it ran at iTunes, that was its thing. Hence the picture there, Steve Jobs live on stage doing it. At the time, um, you know, iPod sales made up 45% of Apple's margin there, so, you know, it was all about the music for them. And they could see that mobile phones were going to be a big threat to that, potentially. Um, they partnered with Motorola um, at the time and just launched effectively a design classic, the Razer, which was the kind of really seminal flip phone. So, you know, parents were good in terms of Apple that did iPod, Motorola did a really nice industrial design on the i. What could go wrong? Um, yeah, it had a hundred song capacity, it required a computer still to manage it, and it was competing against the iPod that Apple had just launched that could manage over a thousand songs on the thing. So, you know, it was already, if you were going to choose a phone, where would you choose that over the iPod? Is it genuinely more compelling than that? Um, amusingly, it failed on stage when Steve Jobs was trying to do a demo, it didn't go backwards, so the portents were not great and good on that one. Um, yes, as um, I think within about 12 months, they'd binned that off entirely, withdrawn from Motorola and went themselves, and you saw the result in terms of on the previous slide there on that. So it's kind of, you know, even the tech titans, the ones that are poster child for product market fit, they may take some time to get there and iterate. And in fact, arguably, Apple still does that in terms of they've just relaunched the HomePod, their home speaker, after withdrawing it two years ago. and. It's just in a slightly different shade of black. That's the only thing I can see different from the pet. So, you know, try, try, try again, and maybe second time, third time lucky. It also applies to these guys as well, no matter how many millions you spend on it. Now, next example in terms of you're a late entrant in a cluttered space with little differentiation. Um, Fire phone. 
Anyone remember this little abomination from uh, Amazon? <laughs> no. Um, now, I actually worked on this in terms of from when I was at HSBC of supporting this. Um, Amazon were very keen because they recognised that having a, a good spectrum of apps there was critical for it to get it to get it launched to customers. Um, and we were quite excited when we got our you know top secret package air freighted over from Seattle and unwrapped it to reveal another black rectangle and it was kind of like mm, uh, uh, all right so maybe not the portents were not great um some of the routes reading up back on this at the time was um you know what problem are you solving here with this amazon's famous for really that customer centric you know number one customer centricity type thing starting off writing the press release etc etc this product is sort of called out something where actually they were solving an internal problem. They were solving a competitive dilemma, a challenge sort of thing, rather than actually trying to solve a customer problem, which is cited for the reason why they launched something that wasn't differentiated, looked the same, did the same thing, had less apps to do it. Um, yeah, it was launched in the summer, it was discontinued by Christmas and they wrote off the whole stock, I think, of several hundred million dollars. And there's, I think, in my old work, there's still one sat in the cupboard somewhere, which if I'd still been there, I would have bought that along just as another black rectangle. Um, yeah, it's because, so, you know, point being that why would you buy the Amazon phone in terms of, it was the same price as the others, but worse in every sort of objective way in terms of it didn't have the same app support, didn't necessarily have any sort of better like um, camera or anything. Um, so, and it had come in several years after. Now, sort of hands up as well, I've got a fairly checkered record of, yes, I was the one person that did an app for a BlackBerry 10, for those of you with even longer memories on those things. Um, by the same, Harway came around uh, knocking a few years later, even I passed up that generous opportunity to support that device. But there's a certain amount here of, although the phone was a failure, actually we still got the bank 20 to sort of 30,000 users at peak from people actually using it on their tablets, sort of thing. And actually the, the way that we'd gone down that in terms of just wrapping our Android app, it was very little work. So phone was a failure, but the, there was a big tablet install base and it helped generally on there so just kind of resetting your expectations over you know is this worthwhile still supporting what is this doing then it was still a success from our point of view at the time at the bank right on to the next one um definitely filed under that just because you can doesn't mean you should I take it most people nods around recognizing this is a uh, sort of first alexa um one of the things um worked on was a, a banking skill I was an Electra, so hot off the heels of the uh, Fire Phone uh, interest. Uh, Amazon were interested in working with us at the time around, right, we're, we're going to be launching this in the UK. We'd like you to partner with it to, to launch some people, you know, do what you're famous for in terms of a banking skill. Um, some of you may be ahead of me already in where this began to sort of run into the rocks on this one. Um, but we, yeah, we designed and prototyped a, hey Alexa, what's my bank balance? <laughs> um, so yes, uh, to, to catch up on the note on this, now one of the important things around a banking experience that people look for is trust and security. Alexa does none of those features in terms of she's a blabber mouth and anyone that knows the <laughs> command words will just shoot out. So if you're living in a flat of one person, this is fine. If you're in a family situation multiple, this is, this is not fine. Um, so we went then down quite a torturous path with some legislation sort of introduced around how you authentify as well, which meant that you had to basically say, hey Alexa, what's my bank balance? Pick up your mobile phone, you know, and it was at which point, no, why is anyone going to speak to it? Because they need their phone in their hand to authenticate, to log in, etc. And yeah, we, we, we didn't launch that, unsurprisingly, and that's why you still can't get a decent banking skill at the moment for Alexa, because fundamentally, it'd be great if you, you know, in terms of back to the accessibility one, there's some really valuable people that would benefit from it, but being able to do it in that secure way just is a bit mind-melting at the moment in terms of the amount of things you're So it's, it's a kind of like, yeah, just because you should, it's not going to work. Okay. 
so and there is a bit around this on even three years after we binned it off someone was still trying to internally sort of flog a version of this that did something slightly different so it, it's kind of Pete you do get invested into these things and you do start looking for well maybe I could use it for this and there is a time when you have to I'm not going to say wake up and uh, smell the uh, smell the roses but recognize sunk cost where it is and move on in terms of can you serve your customers or solve the problem better elsewhere right next area your product isn't sufficiently more compelling than the existing alternatives the customer doesn't want to change um, right now this is FD pay which is introduced in 2019 and turned off in in 2021 um, now what this was was it was a payment keyboard um, so that you could invoke a payment from in a chat sort of thing because it was there to design the sort of social chat like you owe us 50 quid or something for curries and taxi or something last night all right yeah, I can sort that out now don't have to switch out of it, it invoked a little payment sort of screen all worked work very well, allowed you in and out in about 10 seconds to make a payment to someone using their mobile number. Good, you might think. I haven't heard of that, John. No, no, no one has. <laughs> um, there's reasons for that, I suppose. And, um, yeah, one of the critical things around making a payment is you want surety in terms of if I am sending it through the interwebs, I actually want the person you know, who is owed the money or I want to send it to, to get it. Introducing the exciting element of, are they registered, will they get it, will they not, doesn't really breed large sort of scale adoption. You know, generally speaking, customers don't like that. If they want to send a payment, they want someone to get it. Um, now, the, the problem is, I would like to think, not so much with the solution, but more the underpinning scheme. And I could do a whole another half hour on pay M and why that failed but just out of interest who has heard of pay m yes thank you thank you yeah it's turned off this month i think um unlucky uh yeah um so britain's banks did launch a mobile payments system that ran on top of faster payments rails so instantaneous at the same time payments using your mobile numbers yeah you're all looking at me like you crackhead what you want about good you're beginning to see now it failed because all the banks just about without exception uh, called it a different name which if you're offering a payment solution around ubiquity bad idea um, different registration sort of things so the rails that it was running on not everyone ha had or registered and basically customers had to register for pay and place your mobile number onto a database so when someone looked up that mobile number you could see the name and the account number was played back under the covers to the device and the payment was sent so it relied there on, on fundamentally on that on that payment number and unfortunately not enough people had that used that register with that to make any difference then and the friction that you went through to download set up that payment keyboard just wasn't worth it so binned although i would say in terms of there are other ways of measuring success column inches internal kind of pr and sometimes you have to recognize for what it is in terms of it's not going to change the world but maybe you just need to demonstrate you are doing innovation and a bit of glitter uh, in the theatre of innovation, so to speak, I'll call it in terms of recognising for what it, what it is in terms of some time. And there are some people that talk a lot about innovation without actually doing anything innovative because they've launched a number of these sort of things rather than changing stuff because it's hard. Right, your market isn't what you thought it was. At OVO, uh, we launched with a bit of fanfare about 18 months ago a tool uh, called Greenlight that was a product called energy disaggregation, but that basically used your smart meter. Um, so the data from that, and for the more tinfoil hat wearing, no, we are not tracking everything that you do on it, but this, this worked on a big data principle that allowed us to interpret from the base of the consumption what sort of thing was using that power or that charge. With gas, it's relatively simple. It's either your heating or your cooking. With electricity, there's a few more variables, but broadly we can identify with some degree of success things like EV charging, cooking, heating, that kind of thing. So it gives you a breakdown of your, your usage by sort of type. Good. Um, we wrap that up in a, 
um, around reducing your carbon footprint. So inform you because obviously your, your energy usage drives your carbon footprint. Um, and that got some traction. So, but the target market of that was interested, it was people who were interested in reducing their carbon footprint. And it's one of those sort of survey questions, are you interested in reducing your carbon footprint? Most people say yes. Most people do not do anything about reducing it. They just say yes, they're interested in it until you make it really easy. So the, the, kind of the, the market for that, that was great, but it, and it was a good tool, but it only got you know, traction with about 20% of our sort of base there. So you know, the adoption plateaued. And it, you know, that dilemma between interesting versus useful, you know, subscale, is it art for artists, as I sort of, sort of define in terms of it's, it's interesting for a subset, but it's only a, it's not going to get mass market adoption there at that point. However, we reinvented that earlier in the year as energy tracker in terms of, right, well, we know fundamentally because prices are going up, actually, this is a really useful tool to help people understand what on earth am I spending all my money on. So if we repackage it, fundamentally, it's the same thing under the covers. But if we move some of these screens around, move some of this around, but bits and bobs. So probably take it from the potter's wheel to more wheel wheel. Actually, then we got, you know, big uptick in adoption. Yeah, initially, Forex, it's now a lot bigger than that in terms of daily login. And this is driving our now digital adoption because people find it useful to understand roughly what are they using their energy on. So the point being there, we had a tool. It worked perfectly well. The customers that used it found it useful. But actually, there was a way of taking that and making it even more useful for a broader, wider audience. Um, so sometimes you do have to reinvent that wheel and say sort of, you know, context around this, product market fit, you know, is everything. So I think it's a little bit of a call out in terms of when you launch something, don't necessarily expect it to be <laughs> dramatic success. Everyone makes mistakes on this in terms of or needs to sort of iterate to make it better. And sometimes, you know, the solution to, to it is staring in the face of sort of, right, actually, we can use this better. Or sometimes it just does not very good and, <laughs> and you need to step away. But hopefully you've found that useful and uh, vaguely indulgent. But thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> Forgot about this. Yeah, reinventing the wheel. Now, just to, in terms of, but you might think, well, People do keep trying to reinvent the wheel. So you've got the steering wheel and the quite notoriously 1970s, note that interior style there, the Austin Allegro uh, quadratic steering wheel. So, you know, but generally speaking, most cars still end up with a circular steering wheel. However, this has not stopped our friends in America in terms of coming up with the yoke. Now, can anyone spot the obvious kind of, this looks cool? I am driving, you know, light speeder from Star Wars or something. However, I would sort of say that I'm not really, I'm expecting this to go the same way as the Austin Lego quadratic uh, stereo because, you know, it might be fine in America where they don't have corners or something between the thing <laughs> or the car, but it's going to fail. So, yeah, sometimes the wheel is perfectly good and just leave it alone, don't touch it is the best advice sort of thing for this. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>